what should we do with that surplus? Ooh, such a question. It would be nice to pay down some of the debt. Personal income taxes should be cut. I think I'd like to see more spent on education. Send everyone to college. Treatment programs for a lot of drug offenders. Child programs for, uh, you know, working parents. Free lunch programs for children. Probably all of the above. The committee will come to work. The people have often heard promises made from Washington that were abandoned. All favored say aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. If we hold fast to fiscal discipline, we may balance the budget this year, four years ahead of schedule. Let me say to the gentleman, further reserving the right to object, let me say to the gentleman that the problem is that democracy sometimes gets a little messy. And you do in fact... South Carolina's Watch on Washington is made possible by a grant from Bell South. We invite you to participate in a program that makes government more responsive to you. Go ahead, it. Handy. Excel a million at five. Let the good times That's roll. Correct. There's a new budgetary buzzword here in Washington, surplus. Everyone's trying to figure out how to spend it. We'll look at the projected surplus, at the fast-track trade issue, at efforts to codify the agreement between state attorneys general and the tobacco companies. We'll also look at a suddenly transcendent issue, the sex and perjury allegations involving the former White House intern Monica Lewinsky that now swirl around President Clinton. All that's on this edition of our South Carolina's Watch on Washington series, Taxes, Trade, Tobacco. Welcome to this edition of our series of special presentations, South Carolina's Watch on Washington. This is a live broadcast and we invite you to participate with us as we take a look at taxes, trade, tobacco, and at the sex and perjury charges still swirling around President Clinton. Hi, I'm Tina Galland. As you know, a lot's been happening here in Washington recently. You're invited to call in this evening to put questions to members of your congressional delegation and to get answers back. And <coughs> toll-free numbers for you to call are 1-800-368-5781 or 5782. And here to respond to your questions, to react to our brief background reports, and to interact with each other are Senator Fritz Hollings, Democrat, Representative Lindsey Graham, Republican from Seneca, Representative James Clyburn, Democrat from Columbia, and Representative <coughs> Mark Sanford, Republican from Charleston. First, we'd like to take questions from you on the President's alleged improprieties then on taxes, then on trade, and finally on tobacco. And let me begin by asking our guests for their reaction to the allegations, unofficial so far, swirling around President Clinton. Senator, we'll begin with you. Tell us what your reaction is and, and how difficult this is for the president to govern. Uh, Tina, it's difficult to react. Uh, coming in tonight, at first I heard on the radio about the Wall Street Journal and there was a steward that had seen the president and uh, Monica Walensky in a room and came out and there was lipstick on some tissue. And then, just as I was coming out of the car, I heard it was absolutely refuted by that steward, said, that's my name, that's who they're quoting, and it's absolutely false. We don't know, and until and uh, we can find out the exact relationship <coughs> and everything else, I just hesitate making comment because mostly it's political rumor. You're right, and what's interesting about that story is that the Wall Street Journal had put it on their website, in a sense, anticipating tomorrow morning's uh, editions, which has speeded the story up. Uh, Congressman Sanford, how do you react to this? I'm pretty much here in the same center is, and that is people are disturbed about it. They don't like these kind of allegations swirling around the, uh, the White House. Uh, but ultimately, they're reserving judgment at this point. I mean, if in fact the allegations prove true, I think that they're more than deeply unsettling. I think that they're very damaging for the president and for, for that matter, all in government. Mr. Clyburn? <clears throat> well, for the 10, 18 years before coming to Congress, it was my job to supervise these kinds of investigations. I supervised over 500 of them. And I'll tell you what you're going to find. From 65 to 70 percent of these things are absolutely untrue. Around 30 to 35 percent, you'll find some basis in fact, but when you apply the law to it, they tend to, about half of those fall. And so I think that people ought to just wait until the investigations are done, wait until the law is applied, 
And then let's begin to try to make judgments. But let's not uh, follow up every rumor that we hear, because that's what's causing the problem. People are just talking out of school, refuting it the next day. Now we've got the Wall Street <coughs> Journal for doing the same thing that Dallas uh, Morning News Morning did. News. And somebody else did something. So this is absolutely ludicrous, and we ought to stop it. Mr. Graham, your reaction? Well, in another life, I used to be a prosecutor and a defense attorney, and the thing that bothers me the most is somebody's leaking a lot of details, and I'm sure it's happening on both sides, and they need to stop that. The judges involved need to get the lawyers in a room and say, if there's any more of these leaks happening, you're going to suffer some serious consequences, because I don't want anybody tried by innuendo and rumor. The key event to me is, will Monica Lewinsky testify uh, for Kenneth Starr and say that the story on the tape allegedly, whatever the tape says, is true and the affidavit's false. That happens, the president's got a real problem. We'll just wait and see. When, when you say he has a real problem, do you have a sense of where that leads? Corroborating evidence becomes very important. You have a witness who's told one story one time and another story at another time, both under oath, sworn affidavit. So as a prosecutor, you're always suspect of those people. And what I hope to happen is that somebody takes a polygraph. If I was a prosecutor, I'd make her take a polygraph before I'd even begin to go forward. And we'll see just what the corroborating facts are. Slow down a little bit, like the senator says, and see if we can deal with some of these other issues. Senator, are you surprised at the public reaction? Because allegations, though they are, they are indeed shocking. And they're about the president of the United no, States. No, that's <laughs> That's all headline and TV talk about shocking and everything, Absolutely. and we still don't know. And I think the public is pretty mature about this. They were w watching very carefully, and as has been said, it is troubling. And uh, ultimately, I think it's going to be decided in a political forum, not in a court of law. You've Absolutely. got personal behavior that you'd never run on. I can tell you, you wouldn't get reelected <laughs> in my backyard on that. But uh, when they get wild about impeaching the president and everything else, that's not going to occur. Is that wild, uh, Mr. Sanford, if, if indeed these, these allegations, which you described as serious, were to somehow be proved? Again, we're going off into never-never land, and I think as all four of us have very clearly indicated, that's not a good place to go. But to, to answer your question, if that's what you want me to do, I mean, if for some reason these allegations prove true, uh, then, I mean, all kinds of things spin out of control, because at the heart of the matter then becomes the issue of moral authority. And I don't mean that moral as in moralistic, but moral as in as the commander in chief. I mean, for instance, if we go into Iraq, you then have a military structure that is based on the commander in chief, and he has to derive moral authority by, frankly, people trusting his word. If that credibility is ever lost, again, all kinds of things spin out of control. Are Democrats yeah. worried that, that this could, could um, get in the way of the president's ability to govern and to tackle very important issues like military action in Iraq, if indeed that should become necessary? I don't think there's any real worry about that. I think in the first uh, uh, two or three days, yes, that was out there. But I think that uh, after the state of the state, and, and now that people are seeing that most right-thinking Americans want this off the front pages, want this into the investigative process, and us away from it. Let me tell you something about the, these allegations. <coughs> when I ran the last time, two TV stations in Charleston ran some of the most scurrilous stuff you've ever heard about me without any corroborations whatsoever. All of it absolutely false. Brought my daughter into it, interviewed her about the questions. This kind of stuff has got to stop. I mean, there wasn't any truth to it. Nobody tried to find out whether there's the truth to it. And so I can, I can tell you, these kinds of things are just to engender headlines. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the facts. All. Let's let this thing go and stay where it's supposed to be in the investigative process. Our first caller this evening, Dorothy Pillsbury from Walterboro. Ms. Pillsbury, your question? Uh, well, it's not really a question. It's just uh, I'm so tired of hearing about all of this stuff. And uh, I think that the uh, thing in Iraq is much more important than um, what's going on uh, in Washington right now. And I think they should just, uh, everybody should shut up and let the uh, investigators take care of it and, um, and let uh, the president go on and take care of the uh, thing in uh, Iraq. Graham, I think you were, you were um, not <coughs> in agreement. Uh why I'm shutting up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Uh, like Jim says, I think we've all had things said about us in politics, and that's just part of the game, and it does need to stop. But apparently, there's going to be some looking into what happened. There ought to be some looking into what happened. Ken Starr ought to do his job, and if he's doing it for political reasons, he ought to be fired. And if he's used some illegal investigative techniques, I want to know about that as much as I want to know about 
what the truth is with Miss Lewinsky and where the president encouraged her to lie, we're going to get there. We will eventually get to where we can make a determination. Then we'll take appropriate action. If the president lied under oath and lied to the American public, he's history. If he's been unfairly accused, then we ought to all apologize to him and go on about our business. Senator? Well, I want to take the caller's comment about Iraq. I mean, that's far more important. And right to the point, it's not a moral authority. You've got to have constitutional authority on the one hand uh, under the War Powers Act, but more or less uh, commonsensical judgment about this thing. I I've been up here now 30-some years, and uh, right to the point, I've seen the uh, White House misled by both the Pentagon and the Department of State, and it looks like that's about to occur. There's no such thing as a no-casualty war. And what we have under the best of circumstances, total success calls for Saddam still to be there. And the best of circumstances calls for maybe removing uh, the ability to produce anthrax, let's say, mm -hmm. or deliver mm -hmm. anthrax for a period of a year, which you got to stay right on. I'm knocking on that door in my mind now, figuratively, and I'm saying, Mrs. Jones, we just lost your son. She says, what for? I said, just to stay the production and delivery of anthrax for a year. And you think not? She says, go to and slams the door. Come on. So the target really is Saddam. And if they got an operation that just goes in there like we the mother superior about everyone who's got uh, Weapons of mass destruction. We have weapons of mass destruction. Gaddafi's got weapons of mass destruction. You're saying China, that's not good enough. That's right. China's got weapons. And we're not the mother superior running around the world starting wars, particularly now that you got a heck of a fall out there. You're going to have Peter on it with all the children and women killed and so forth. You're going to have the situation of the Arab which, community which that's not with us. Uh, uh, all of these things. I think that uh, old Saddam is like Burr Rabbit and Uncle Remus. I think he wants a strike. I think he wants to come back after that strike to get those uh, uh, requirements, uh, restrictions on him lifted. I, I really do. Let's try to uh, fit in another question from Mr. W.O. Adams, North Myrtle Beach. Mr. Adams, your question. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering if any state laws or federal laws were violated by the lady Tripp uh, uh, making tapes of uh, the other party without her knowledge, and if so, if uh, she did that, uh, took the other lady into a confidence, I think she should be tarred and feathered and run out of Washington. Well, that's kind of interesting because um, if you read Maryland state law, and this thing was supposed to have happened in Maryland, on its face, she violated the state law. Mm. Under the Maryland state law, you cannot tape a conversation unless both parties agree to it. And so that's a violation of the law. And so there's some a uh, question now as to whether or not uh, there ought to be some kind of uh, state investigation into what she did. In his State of uh, the Union address last week and in his budget released this week, President Clinton has proposed increasing spending on a range of domestic programs and using a modest budgetary surplus to shore up Social Security. The Republicans in Congress have called for tax cuts. Remember this evening the toll-free number is for you to call with your questions 1-800-368-5781 or 5782. As we begin taking your questions on the President's budgetary priorities and on the Republicans' tax cuts, here's a brief background report. Tonight I come before you to announce that the federal deficit, once so incomprehensibly large that it had 11 zeros, will be simply zero. Now, if we balance the budget for next year, it is projected that we'll then have a sizable surplus in the years that immediately follow. What should we do with this projected surplus? I have a simple four-word answer. Save Social Security first. With this dramatic announcement in his State of the Union address, the president opened the floodgates for budgetary proposals, some to pay down the debt, which now stands at $5 trillion, some to cut taxes, some to increase spending, some to do all three. 
While preaching caution, the president himself has proposed increasing spending for scientific research, expanding Medicare coverage, hiring 100,000 new teachers, and repairing school buildings. He's also announced another major initiative. I am proud to propose the single largest national commitment to child care in the history of the United States. For his part, the Republican House Speaker Newt Gingrich said, the surplus's first goal should be to pay down the debt. It's a move that could reduce interest rates, stimulate the economy, and ease dealing with some of the other looming fiscal challenges, such as the long-term stability of both Medicare and Social Security. But the Speaker and his Republican colleagues also have another goal. I would like to see us, as a goal, try to get to at least a small tax cut every year. The balanced budget agreement last year included a $500 per child tax credit for parents jointly earning under $110,000, as well as reductions in the capital gains and inheritance taxes. Some of those seeking further tax cuts have targeted the so-called marriage penalty, which requires some 21 million couples to pay more filing jointly than they would pay if single filing individually. Others have suggested across-the-board reductions in income tax rates. Still others favor fundamental tax reform, scrapping the current code and either replacing the graduated income tax with a flat tax or replacing the income tax altogether with a national sales tax. Hoping to spark a grand national debate on fundamental tax reform, Republican Representative Billy Tawson of Louisiana and Republican House Majority Leader Dick Armey have taken to the hustings. Okay, let me just start first of all, and this is very important, it's a difficult point, and uh, an awful lot of slow learners don't pick up on this. While Mr. Uh, Army advocates a flat tax, and Mr. Tawson a national sales tax, they jointly attack the current tax code and the agency which administers it. Mr. Tawson refers to the IRS as the most un-American institution this country has ever had. He complains that in disputes with the IRS, you are guilty until proved innocent. With the IRS, they can seize your assets, freeze your accounts, lien your property, and even if you are right, try getting those liens off, try building your credit back. We heard those horror stories in Washington at the Senate hearings last week. Fella killed himself, left a suicide note so his wife could have the benefits of his insurance policy to fight the IRS that was fighting him down in his grave. She took the money, continued fighting him, and eventually won. But what did she lose? She and her children lost their husband and their father to an IRS agency of our own government that presumes your guilt until you prove your innocence. A bill to reform the IRS and remove this presumption of guilt has already passed the House and is expected to be among the first measures to come before the Senate as the second session of the 105th Congress gets underway. Again, these are the toll-free numbers for you to call with your questions, 1-800-368-5781 or 5782. Let's hear from the participating members of the South Carolina Congressional Delegation. Mr. Sanford, what do you think we ought to do with the uh, budget surplus the president um, outlined? Tina, I wish uh, that was sold as we were there, but I think there are a number of us at this table that would probably agree on the fact that we're not there because, I mean, th this is the budget. And if you were to look through its hundreds of pages, the most interesting thing I think that you would see that is in here is the fact that the national debt will go up by over a hundred billion dollars this year. And it, you'd say, well, wait a minute, if we're not going to run a deficit, how do you add a hundred billion dollars to the debt? And the reason is we will borrow a hundred billion dollars from the Social Security Trust Fund. So we're not really in the land of real surpluses if we were accounting the way the rest of the world accounts. But he, what he's it, right. Yes, he's right. Hey, no, no question. Yeah. Uh, I've been on this budget committee since we started back in 1974, and I've learned how to read those books. You look on page 10, they have a surplus of $9.5 billion for this year. But you look on page 367, and it's more than 100. It's exactly 194.5. Mm -hmm. The debt goes up. We have to borrow $194.5 billion. So uh, my friend John, just opening the program, says we're going to enjoy a surplus. I hate to disillusion him, but I'm not playing that Washington shell game. I mean, why, we're not near a surplus. And in contrast to rather bringing the deficit down, as we have now for five years, and you give the president credit for that, now we're heading in the other direction with that budget. Our caller is uh, John Bursick from Charleston. Mr. Bursick, your question. 
Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. Senator Hollins has already hit on exactly what I'm confused about, and that's the term budget surplus. Because I, my understanding is we have a uh, deficit of over, is it $4 trillion? 5.5. When we yeah. talk about a budget surplus, is all of this excess money directly going to pay down this $4 trillion or plus deficit? Or is, is what they're debating is where to spend it, and is it all going to go toward that? Or are they going to spend it in other areas? Well, the debt, debt uh, not just the deficit, but the debt itself, the overall national debt is now at $5.5 trillion. Interest costs are projected in there at $1 billion a day, $365 billion that we spend for absolutely nothing. But it's we the have largest the president, thing in the budget. We yeah. have the president suggesting that it's time to expand some programs, programs that have a great deal of popular support, Mr. Claiborne. Well, programs for children, for classrooms. Well, I'd like for somebody to tell me how in the world will welfare to work work if you don't have daycare? How do you do it? You can't do it, and we all know that. And so it's not just about uh, adding new programs, it's about trying to make effective those reform measures we took a year ago and the year before that. Those things cannot work if we don't do what the president is proposing in this budget. And, and I think that's a very legitimate debate, in other words, that one could have on where the priorities ought to be. But in, in beginning that debate, I think the first step would be honest accounting, which is basically what we don't have. And I'm not faulting just the president. That's basically all of Washington, because what I think was most revealing of all was the fact that, you know, two years ago in each of the budgets, uh, and I'm sure you were in, on the Finance Committee putting this together, there was a thing called generational accounting that has now been taken out of the budget and what it says based on this larger issue, which is Social Security, Medicare, all the entitlement programs that are on automatic pilot, that the future tax for the next generation is 82% if we do nothing to get things back on track. Let's take another call from Doug Newhouse in Greenville. Mr. Newhouse, your question? Yes. Uh they say that there's going to be a surplus this year for the social for the budget, where they're borrowing 60 to 70 to 100 billion dollars a year from Social Security. Well, I'm 33 years old and I've uh, been paying into Social Security since I've been working since I was 12, and I figure I'll work another 20 or 30 years. And uh, I want to know how they can have a surplus when they're borrowing the money from a trust fund, which means you're not supposed to be able to touch the money except for the people who are going to use it. Thanks. Mr. Graham, do you want to tackle well, that one? Well, let's just, you know, I haven't read the whole budget, but here's the understanding I have. There's a, every year you pay more in Social Security taxes than you pay out in benefits as a surplus. Instead of leaving the money alone and letting it grow for future retirees like the baby boomers, the gentle, gentleman there, we take the extra money and we run the federal government with it. We borrow the money and we put an IOU in its place. $600 billion, I believe, Senator, is owed to the Social Security Trust Fund. So we have a $5.5 trillion national debt. We owe about $600 billion to the Social Security Trust Fund. I think what all of us are saying, that if you want to count the money owed to Social Security, we're not where we want to be. But let's talk about some good news. The deficit has gone from 290 to 300 and something billion down to zero, and that's good news. That's like your checking account. The debt is your mortgage. You got to pay off this huge five and a half trillion dollar mortgage, but we finally got the checking account balanced, and that's a start. And that's been a bipartisan effort. The Republican Party slowed spending down from 5.2 percent growth to about 3.2. President Clinton raised the money in '93 from taxes that he applied to the debt. Let's don't blame each other and take overly too much credit. We've done it together. Now we've got to pay off five and a half trillion dollars debt. And if you put every penny of the surpluses into the Social Security system, you're not going to save Social Security. Social Security fundamentally needs to change. And Mark has got a proposal I think we need to all listen to. Should we listen to that now, Mr. Sanford, or should we get Mr. Phipps? Let's, let's go, go to let's Walter Phipps. Phipps. Yeah, 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 Mr. Phipps, to me. Mr. Phipps uh, let, let's go to you and your question, and we'll get back to uh, Congressman Sanford's proposal in a moment. Okay, well, his uh, comments are basically along the same lines of the question I have. Has anyone taken a good, long, hard look at uh, what the administration for the past five, uh, eight years has proposed and done? As I see it, uh, currently the long-range effects of this administration are going to be very similar to uh, Mr. Hoover's administration in the uh, mid-twenties. Uh, am I the only one that sees this, or 
do you? Does anyone else? Anyone want to sign on to uh, Mr. Phipps' analogy that this well, is like uh, President Hoover's? Well, no, he may not be the only, only one, but he, uh, I don't think anybody around this table right. is, see it, is here that way. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I think that um, when we talk about uh, the debt, and I think, uh, uh, Lindsay, you're absolutely correct, and I think people ought to look at that. Uh, you can't get a, to the debt until you take care of the deficit. And I think we've done a great job over the last couple of years, and we got that down. To zero. And I want this gentleman to know that this administration has only been in office for five years. Now, what happened three years before that has got nothing to do with this administration. And, and let me just say, before all of us get too excited, I think the chief reason we've uh, wiped out the deficit is a strong economy. The American public has sent more in taxes than we ever anticipated in spending, and we've controlled spending a bit, and the strong economy has allowed us to wipe out the deficit ahead of schedule. And really, the winners and the heroes are the American people who I agree with that and I want to say this before this night is over you're absolutely correct and the reason we're there is because of what we did in 1993 and we turned this economy around with a uh, uh, with a vote in 1993 that cost a lot of my classmates their jobs up here in the Congress but now it's been proven that they were absolutely right in that vote and we did it without a single vote from your side. Well, Congressman I, I Samuel, could, I could, I could, could disagree more. Yeah. Wow. Right. Get another so, on this. so that was a short, we all love each other. <laughs> um, can you quickly tell us about uh, the proposal that your colleague just alluded to? Oh, just yes. in briefest form, the, what the President's talked about, what other people are talking about in terms of putting, leaving the Social Security trust money in the trust fund is a first step. The second step is addressing the fact that 70 million baby boomers start to retire mm -hmm. in 2012. And what the trustees have said is if we do nothing, we're in trouble. So what we've proposed as a possible remedy is to say, well, what, what if we left everybody already on Social Security on Social Security? But we offered people below the age of 65 simply the choice of either staying in Social Security as we know it or redirecting a portion of their payroll tax, not to Washington, but instead into their own personal savings account. We think it's one of the keys because basically the math is real simple. In saving Social Security, either you cut current benefits, you raise payroll taxes on young people, or you let somebody earn more on their Social Security investment. We're looking at that third option. Okay. Whatever Congress does or doesn't do about taxes, it seems clear that it will do something about the agency that collects taxes, the IRS. We asked some of you what you think about the IRS, and more specifically, its presumption of taxpayer guilt. And this is what you told us. I have had a run-in before myself, and you are guilty, and it is hard to fight a system. There are big people. I'm just a little person. Well, I've been a victim of it a couple times, so uh, I, I think there is something that needs to be changed on it. Uh, they... they uh, make you pay up front if they see a mistake and then it, you have to prove that you were innocent and then you have to fight them to get your money back so something something's wrong there I don't know how the IRS got the kind of power that it d does have but that presumption should be removed because it's distinct from the legal system as we know it historically and even today IRS reform legislation has passed the House. It's now in the Senate. Senator Hollings, tell us about uh, what you think the prospects are for reform. You're going to have to ask the majority leader. We're trying our darndest. We signed the letter, every <laughs> Democrat on the, our side and some of the Republicans to please bring it up. We wanted to pass that this past week. And what's really occurred, they got a good bill from the House side. And we're ready to go with it. I've joined on three years ago with John Kerry of Nebraska whereby as these clients there talking, I was a lawyer and I've represented them and the presumption of guilt is there when you go before the IRS, you've got to prove their innocence and they can hold up your home, your car, take your savings account and everything else of that kind. We're gonna turn that presumption around. We're gonna have an oversight commission to watch how they're doing the things and make all of these kind of IRS reforms. And if they could call it tomorrow morning, we'd pass it almost unanimously on the Senate side. Our next question is from Jerome Smalls in Charleston. Mr. Smalls. Yes, I'm glad that uh, Senator Hall was mentioning this about the IRS because my call was concerning the Social Security Administration. I think we need the same kind of oversight committee because I'm, for one, uh, as a victim, I've been trying to get my disability from Social Security, which I've paid in all my life. And uh, I'm getting the runaround, and also here, the presumption of guilt. Be, I've had uh, proof from the medical university. I've been to all of the dermatologists. I've been fighting this for a year. Uh, even the mayor of this city 
uh, can vouch that uh, my skin has been damaged uh, to the point that my hands, uh, everyone, all the political officials, everyone, I'm quite well known in the community, they can vouch that these conditions were not on my skin. I've, I've supplied all the information that I can to the Social Security Administration and uh, even went through Senator Hall's office for some help, and they were even incapable. Mr. Smalls, let me ask um, the uh, members of Congress whether they get from their constituents a lot of complaints about their treatment, either at the IRS or, in this case, from the Social Security Administration. I mean, this has to be a hot-button issue for constituents. I've been involved with an uh, effort by the South Carolina Republican Party to have town meetings to abolish the IRS. The chairman of the Democratic Party in Aiken came and said, go for it. This is one thing that cuts across party lines. I think it cuts across every line there is to cut. People are intimidated by the IRS. They say it's too hard for them to prove you guilty. That's their argument, that it takes too many people and it's too hard. Well, welcome to the real world. It's too hard for us to prove ourselves innocent. The IRS as an institution with 110,000 people with a 7 million word tax code is short for this world. And I think you're going to see Republicans and Democrats press that issue. It will be a key vote in 1998, I think, to sunset the tax code with a date certain and replace it with something we can all understand. Our next caller is Paul Shirley from Easley. Mr. Shirley, your question. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'd like to know if anyone can tell me the total amount of money that has been borrowed from the Social Security system since its beginning. $732 billion. $732 billion. Right. Okay, uh, thank you. I'd like to also uh, just say that uh, Mr. Smalls uh, that called before uh, expressed some of the same concerns that I have as far as uh, uh, abusive uh, treatment within the Social Security system. Uh, there's problems. There are problems there. And, and if you all have not been contacted by, it, uh, by your constituency, uh, then we constituents need to get on the ball. So well, I think, I think these members of Congress are, are, are jotting this down, and you must hear from this. And part of this is the anger toward government that we Yeah, I mean, it takes someone. one trip to the driver's license uh, department to figure out that one size fits all out of Washington or any place at times gets difficult just from a bureaucratic standpoint. And I, I think all of us have a couple of caseworkers in our respective offices that help people on casework. And one of the things I think hardest is, frankly, disability. You've got to be practically dead to qualify for disability. And I think that sets up, again, the contrast between these personal savings accounts that have been tried, for instance, down in South Texas there they created a system of social security wherein if one was injured basically automatically they simply got two-thirds of what they were making prior to the injury moving to another issue now the president is trying to get renewal of so-called fast-track trade authority you're invited to call in with questions about it the toll-free numbers again 1-800-368-5781 or 5782 and as we begin taking calls on this issue here's a brief background report Renewing fast-track trade legislation would enable President Clinton to negotiate treaties with other countries and offer them for an up or down vote by the Congress. These fast-track treaties would not be vulnerable to amendments that might require their being renegotiated. According to the President, he needs renewal of this fast-track authority to enable the United States to compete effectively in the global marketplace. According to others, including many members of the President's own Democratic Party, the Congress should have the right to insist on amendments to trade agreements to protect the environment and to protect American workers. Our neighbor to the south has been a problem for the environmentalists. They've complained for some time that Mexico and other countries do not require their industries to meet minimally safe environmental standards. It's a view articulated by Cameron Duncan of Greenpeace in criticizing some of the maquiladora industries, the American industries now operating in Mexico just across the border. In San Elisadio, Texas, uh, for example, there was a, a shared aquifer which has been contaminated by, uh, by the maquiladora plants uh, in, in uh, operating in that area. Uh, and as a result, about a third of children, all children in, uh, on the Mexican side of the border, contract hepatitis A by the age of eight. And uh, about 90% of all, all adults contract hepatitis by the time they're 35.
labor unions have been losing their memberships as some workers have been laid off by firms moving some of their operations overseas or south of the border to take advantage of lower wage costs. A small group of laid off workers recently gathered around the kitchen table at Ray Walter's home in North Canton, Ohio. They talked about their plight, which they say they share with large numbers of displaced workers elsewhere. We're already losing jobs, and other communities are losing jobs. And it's not going to get any better. They're taking American jobs and transplanting them to Mexico. All this is going to do is, is just transplant jobs from our country to their country. The people in this country need to be made more aware of what's actually happening. The, the majority of the middle class and the working class of this country, they have no idea how many of these companies are going down there and, and, and how the government's backing that move. You know, their own government's making that possible. They're, it's, they're like having an incentive program for them to go there. The Europeans and the Japanese, the way they compete is they raise productivity through investment in their plants, new, new equipment. And it seems like our, our companies, their answer to competing <clears throat> is to ship the jobs down to a slave wage nation. That's what Mexico is. So that's their way of competing. Environmental groups and labor unions combined to slow down President Clinton's push for fast-track trade legislation. They stalled it in the last session of Congress. The president has promised to push for it again at this session, but the issue remains in doubt. Let's get an assessment of the fast-track trade authority and its impact on South Carolina, beginning with you, Senator. <laughs> Tina, the idea of fast-track is to give the president authority whereby he formulates a particular trade treaty and you take it or leave it, no amendments. And he says that's necessary because these trade agreements are so complex that uh, the countries won't really come in and negotiate with the United States if they learn that the Congress has got to lay up upon, review it, and pass upon it, and perhaps amend it. That's totally out of the whole clause. The president said if you can get a copy of his uh, State of the Union address, one paragraph further after he said, we've gotten 240 trade treaties here in the last five years, and only four of them were with fast track, and four of them this past year, very complicated, were all without fast track, the telecommunications, International telecommunications with 123 countries. But the we chemical, live in this global economy. Yeah, that no, we no, need no, to no, 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 no. Listen to the fact. Yeah. That's background music. Global, uh, well, the global treaty that uh, Pre uh, Vice President Gore he ran over to Kyoto, signed that with over 100 and some countries without fast track. The financial services and of course the chemical weapons treaty. So we've had four big treaties in the last year without fast track. And so he doesn't need it, and you know, we want us congressmen and senators to look at what we're voting on, and not just up and down and have the vote fixed like it was in NAFTA. NAFTA's been a disaster. Instead of the drugs going down, they've gone up. Instead of immigration going down, they've gone up. And instead of unemployment going down, it's gone up down in Mexico, and we've lost 400,000 jobs here. Let's check with your Republican colleagues and find out whether we have a difference of opinion on that. What do you think, Mr. Graham? Well, I was in a minority position in the Republican Party as I opposed Fast Track. The concept of uh, the president negotiating treaties for, for the United States versus 435 or 535 members of Congress is a concept that makes sense. But we are a body elected by the people, and I agree with the senator, that do a bilateral agreement with Chile. They're saying we need to knock down trade barriers in Chile, that the Canadian are coming in there really going in the marketplace and that, that we're losing uh, some advantage. Well, do a treaty with Chile and send it up here and we're reasonable people. Let us have a chance to look at it and if it's a good deal, we'll pass it. But we're losing a lot of jobs. We're losing our manufacturing base in this country. And I'm not really uh, excited about expanding the scope of trade agreements where the fairness is left out. Let's, let's move to another important issue. As one of the nation's leading tobacco growing states, South Carolina will be one of the most severely impacted by the proposed tobacco legislation. The toll free number is for you to call with your questions on this issue, 1-800-368-5781 or 5782. And as we begin taking your calls, here's a brief background report. Tobacco is America's oldest cash crop. This jovial weed, as the colonists called it, has always been a source of controversy. Historians recall that even prior to the first permanent English settlement at Jamestown, Virginia, King James had described smoking this way, a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, 
dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. Historians also recall that Sir Walter Raleigh and others in the England of that time continued to puff contentedly on their pipes. While a smoking controversy has swirled down through the years, at no time has tobacco been under such relentless, vigorous, massive attack as now. The medical profession has linked tobacco to lung cancer and to heart disease. And most recently, researchers at Wake Forest University in North Carolina found that secondhand smoke posed these same dangers to non-smokers. The nation's surgeon generals believe that cigarette smoking is the chief preventable cause of illness and premature death, causing some 350,000 potentially avoidable deaths annually. 170,000 from coronary heart disease, 130,000 from lung cancer, and 50,000 from chronic obstructive lung diseases such as bronchitis and emphysema. The Tobacco Institute disputes these estimates. It is denied that there is a scientifically provable link between smoking and these illnesses. Groups activated by health concerns, however, seek to restrict smoking and penalize tobacco companies. These groups, represented by some 40 of the nation's state attorney generals, recently negotiated a major unprecedented settlement with the tobacco companies. In exchange for limits on the industry's potential liability, the tobacco companies have agreed to provide $368.5 billion over the next quarter of a century to help the states pay for the treatment of smoke-related illnesses. The deal would also establish a public education campaign against smoking, set up new stop smoking campaigns, ban smoking in most indoor locations, restrict tobacco sales and advertising, strengthen warning labels on cigarette packs, and codify the Food and Drug Administration's ability to regulate tobacco. Do you have a preference as to smoking or non-smoking? Non-smoking. Okay, right this way. As for the nation's tobacco farmers, they worry about their livelihood. They talk about ghost towns in, in the West from what it used to be, uh, but they, they're nothing compared to what ghost towns would occur in, in eastern North Carolina if you did away with tobacco. All the farmers the same way. They're cutting the acres every year. It looks to me like it's going to get scarcer and scarcer to me. It looks like it's going out. Members of Congress from tobacco-growing states see the deal as a vehicle for huge infusions of economic aid for tobacco farmers. President Clinton has suggested strengthening the deal to increase the cost to tobacco companies. Other members see it as a launching pad for broader legislation to combat drug and alcohol use. You need one more on there, Gladys? Yeah. Okay. So the controversy over tobacco that began with King James and the colonists continues today. Whether the deal between health advocates and tobacco companies wins translation into federal legislation remains immensely complex and, well, clouded in smoke. Shutting the door on the tobacco leaf is easier than shutting the door on the tobacco controversy. The agreement between the state attorneys general and the tobacco companies is complicated. It is also unprecedented. Representative Sanford, do you think it will become law? Uh, I have my doubts um, because I, I guess for a number of different reasons. First, I think there are very serious questions here about simply the issue of states' rights. And if you look at this federal budget, what was talked about uh, in this increase in the budget of $150 billion in new spending was in large part, and let's back up for a second, $150 billion. If you take the, the 500 plus thousand people out of any of our respective congressional districts or out of a, a part of the state that you represent, it would take all of those people paying federal taxes 147 years to pay $150 billion to the federal government. So A, we're talking about a lot of money here, but B, what's been proposed is out of that sum, 65 billion of it be paid for with, quote, the tobacco settlement. The problem here, which goes back to the issue of states' rights, is the state attorney generals went out and negotiated, in essence, a deal with companies on their own. Now the federal government steps in and says, hey, uh -huh. I like this deal, I think I'll take this money. So I think th it may break apart for that very reason. The other reason it may very well break apart is that I think it's a very dangerous precedent to, to set a, a, a budget 
built on anticipated income, this $65 billion that may or may not come about. Our next caller is Jason Annan from Clemson. Mm -hmm. Mr. Annan, your question? Yeah, um, I, I have actually, it's a two-part question. One, is there still a subsidy on tobacco farmers? And two, if there is, does it make sense to charge a tax on cigarettes, yet the government's still giving money to tobacco farmers to grow a product that obviously Bill Clinton doesn't want to see around? Senator? No, there's not a subsidy on the tobacco farmer. They pay a tax at the time at the warehouse when the sales are made, which takes care of the federal program. So it's no cost to the federal government, but uh, let me make sure we understand how that agreement was flawed. The $368 billion had everyone in mind except one group, and that is the crowd that makes their living, namely the tobacco farmer. I got together with Senator Ford of Kentucky. We promulgated a bill, introduced it to take care of the tobacco farmer. I now have had uh, Senator McKean say, let's get a bipartisan effort. We've introduced the $368 billion agreement with $28.5 billion in that taking care of the tobacco farmer, namely allowing him to continue to grow tobacco as he has for the, <coughs> for the past 60 years, giving him uh, uh, support for his quota, a financial thing. It's all paid now by the tobacco companies rather than the government in that state. Otherwise, coming back further and taking care of the communities, the warehousemen, the children with respect to uh, Pell Grants getting into college and those kind of things, so they won't be ghost towns as they had in the West. And I think that uh, if we can work that out, uh, yes, we can get an agreement, and I think they're going to be precious because everybody's for child care, everybody's for more teachers, everybody's for more cops on the beat, everybody's for more on this immigration border patrol, and where are they going to get the money? I have a bill in that says you're not going to get it from Social Security. I have a little measure in at the present time that says no, uh, the Social Security surplus shall not be used as a set-aside for any tax cut or spending increase. Mr. Clyburn, you were yeah. nodding your head yes. You, you support a tobacco deal if oh, it can absolutely. be done, yes. Absolutely. I think we've got to do it because I think the Senate is absolutely correct. We forgot about the farmers. We forgot about those people at the warehouses, those people who make their livings. We forgot about the infrastructure that are developing in uh, cities and towns like Timmonsville and Lake City and Mullins and Marin and Florence and Darlington. They have whole cultures that have grown up and developed around this product. And so we've got to do a deal because if you don't, I think the senator will tell you, you've got some people up here that's proposing dollar and 50 cents tax on, on per, uh, pack, uh, right. per pack as standalone legislation, and they'll probably get it passed, and our farmers uh, will go down the drain. So I think we've got to do this deal. Fred Whittington from Anderson. Mr. Whittington, thank you for being patient. Your question, please. Yeah, I appreciate your taking my call here. I wonder if the panelists have given any consideration to these uh, taxes that will be coming in from the uh, tobacco industry and whether it would be a good idea to channel those funds into the, let's say, the Medicare uh, trust fund for the uh, use of, say, former smokers or just the uh, recipients of uh, Medicare services uh, altogether. What's the panelists' view there? Uh, that's a good point. We talked about that um, uh, today on the floor. The problem I have is that there's going to be a piling on effect. There's only so much you can... People hate tobacco companies, and tobacco companies are their own worst enemy. They've lied to the American people for a long time, and people are very mad at them. But let's don't get angry at a group of people and give the money to the federal government because you're mad at them. There's a lot of folks in this country that could do a lot better job with the money than us. Put it in Medicare. Leave it at the state level. You know what we've done with the money? We spent it before we ever got it. This budget, as the Senator Marcus said, has spent money that's not even legally available to the federal government, and that's the sin, I think, of sending a dollar up here, is that you're going to get it spent if you don't watch it. Our next caller is Ray Brewer from Liberty. Mr. Brewer, your question. Uh, yes, ma'am. I want to know why is it that you were talking about tobacco, but how about liquor? I mean, is anything being done, money putting in to uh, <laughs> stop uh, liquor, control liquor, would people drink and get out here and kill people on the road? And I'd like to, if one of them on the panel would know how many people are killed every year because of liquor. Anyone here in favor of uh, uh, regulating liquor along the lines that... Uh, Oh, yeah, well, it is right now. Yes. I mean, you know, as you look at the taxes on liquor, and they're, they're substantial. And I think that's the, the day, I think Lindsay addresses very well. You want to watch out for a piling on effect because, in other words, 
we can point to all kinds of ills, but the fact of the matter is throughout society, uh, governments have never been able to completely cure a lot of those ills. So what you don't want is to build a revenue stream, in other words, to build chunks of government, whether it's teachers or, or policemen, on a, an income stream that then government, in essence, is the one that next gets addicted, and what government gets addicted to is that income. You all have been pointing out the, the numerous problems with this kind of an agreement and the fact that it was crafted by state attorneys general, and now the federal government is saying we'd like to get into this, and yet it has to be approved and sanctioned by Congress. What is the likelihood this will happen this year? You know, I don't think the federal government went out and asked uh, uh, the manufacturers to come. I think the manufacturers came to the federal government. No, they didn't come to the federal government. They came to the state attorney generals. Right. Well, state yeah. attorney generals, yeah, on a case-by-case basis. Right. But what they're trying to do, they came to the federal government and said, look, we don't want to go through 50 states. Mm -hmm. We want us to do one national thing and, and, and stop this thing. So, I mean, the manufacturers came and asked the federal government to do one national law. We didn't go out and say, y'all come and let us do this. Well, we've got to have one right. observation here, right to the point. Uh, we have put advertisements on every pack of cigarettes for 35 years now, dangerous to your health. Not a single tobacco case has been won. They had a favorable verdict down in Florida that's on appeal. We've got one going on up in uh, Minnesota now, but I can tell you they can delay in the courts for Absolutely. the next four, five, ten years, get nothing done, the children will continue to smoke, you won't get the companies, can, you know, cooperating with respect to the advertising. The money, Lindsay, does go to the states. That's why the state's attorney generals for Medicaid to take care of these health costs and everything else like that. So there's a lot to be said about this particular arrangement. If you do nothing, right. I can tell you right now, you're going to cause more health costs and everything else of that kind. So it's got to be looked at in, in, in the real light. Mac Nicholson from Pageland. Mr. Nicholson, your question. My question is, isn't, the le is, isn't it good legislation to, to do away th with tobacco or to uh, suppress it? Uh, I ask you, do you want your own children to smoke? Do, uh, do you think they promote tobacco in the wrong way? to get the youth hooked, and I just spent a lot of money, a lot of time, uh, helping my son stop smoking. And he, and he basically is a reason. I have two tobacco barns behind my house. I've cropped tobacco. I've suckered it. I've pulled it in with a sled. I know all about it. We made money that way. But if it's not good, it should go away. Uh, the question is, isn't that good legislation to try to get tobacco away? Well, uh, we're spending money based on a tobacco settlement, a dollar and fifty cents tax that will come to the federal government on top of what they've paid to the state government to settle the cases with each individual attorney general. Uh, people are trying to profit from this settlement. My point is this. I, I'm glad your son doesn't smoke. I don't have any kids. If I had any, I hope they wouldn't smoke. I think we as parents and we in society need to help people do the right thing. The advertising center at Hollings, you're right. We need to control the way tobacco companies market to our youth. But I didn't come up here to Washington to be people's mom and daddy. I just tell you right now, there's a lot of things out there that are bad for you, but don't expect me to solve all your problems up here. Our next caller is Henry Hudson from Beaufort. Mr. Hudson, your question? Yes, my question is, why is it such a big conspiracy, a big thing to um, stop smoking and tobacco use when there is nothing being done or said about the restaurants that offers buffet and all you can eat while killing just as many people with heart and artery diseases as there is dying from tobacco. Mr. Clyburn, you want to tackle that one? <laughs> no, I said that one. Depends on if you like uh, steak or right? well, we uh, <laughs> Tax <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. Not not diabetes, that. come on. Yeah, that's true, and I, and I like fried chicken, but I'd say I'm not, I'm not getting <laughs> on Well, the likelihood of, of this issue being resolved then, Senator, do you think? It's touch and go right now. Yeah. I think the main thing is to look at it realistically. If you want to get some good done, really control the ills of tobacco, now this is a good way to go. If you do nothing and just try to take the dollar and a half and run, then you're going to put everybody out and it's going to put more people on welfare and it's going to cost the Absolutely. government. Uh, you're going to have the little children still getting in there smoking and everything else of that kind. So I think the Congress, uh, all of us in the Senate, We'll all sober up, and I think we'll get something done this year. With just a few seconds left, let's, what specifically, uh, Mr. Sanford, would you like to see in that legislation if it's going to get done this uh, year? 
in the tobacco legislation? What would be the key a, uh, a giant rider attached in the Senate that works on correcting the ills of Social <laughs> Security because, uh, again, we can talk about issues like this, which are important, but I think we need to always focus on the big things first. Washington has a way of marginalizing itself in that they'll spend days working on something incidental to people's lives and yet on something very, very big, and again, there is probably nothing bigger in people's lives as it relates to federal policy than Social Security. We don't spend the time we ought to. And so I, I would, uh, in terms of my wish list, I'd you say the a rider <laughs> and uh, work on Social Security. We're running out of time yeah. here, Mr. Yeah. Clyburn. Well, as I said, I'm all for doing this deal because I think that it will be really catastrophic for us to continue to go state by state for 50 states. And who knows, South Carolina may be the last state up. And what would happen to our people uh, if Mr. we Crane. were to do that? quickly. Well I, well, I hope we do something responsible to deal with the ills of tobacco, and I hope we don't give the federal government a bunch of money to spend on things that we shouldn't be doing. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of South Carolina's Watch on Washington series of special presentations. I want to thank the members of your congressional delegation for their participation, and I want to thank you for watching and especially for calling in with, with your questions this evening. For South Carolina's Watch on Washington, I'm Tina Galland. Good night. South Carolina's Watch on Washington has been made possible by a grant from Bell South. We believe that an active, informed citizenry is essential to democracy's success.